Okay, so this video is the second part of lesson 8.3. If you want to call it 8.3.2, uh, that's fine. Um, we um, would have just gone over this homework in class today, and now let's look at some more uh, real-world examples using these vectors and there's resultants. Um, find the force required to keep a 50-pound wagon from sliding down a ramp. So when we think of objects, we're going to reduce them down to like a point. Almost like uh, their center of mass or their center of gravity. Think of it as condensed down to exactly one point. And there's uh, 50 pounds and that 50 pounds is going straight down. Gravity pulls it you know, straight down. All right. Um, so what we want to know is what is this force? That's the force due to gravity. It's pulling the wagon down. If that hill, that, that ramp was flat, then there would be no force, right? There'd be no force pulling it down the hill if there is no downward, you know. And then if you think about it, the steeper the hill is, the more gravity is pulling on it and it's going to, um, it's, it's going to require more force to hold it in place. Okay, so, um, so the ramp is inclined at 20 degrees. So we know this angle in here is 20 degrees. Now this is sort of the beginnings of what you're going to see in physics. In physics, we often take forces and break them up. And in this kind of situation, we want two different forces. We want what's called the normal force, which is the force that goes down perpendicular to the surface. So we take this 50 pound force and we think of it as the resultant and then we think about okay what are the two forces that would result in, if we added them up if they would result in that resultant 50 50 pound force okay so what we do is we have one force that's perpendicular to the surface to that ramp and so this is a right angle and so that force is really holding the um it, it's gravity it's the force due to gravity broken up into two components or two vectors one is perpendicular to the surface it's essentially holding that wagon down against the surface and then the other one here is the force due to gravity of course that's pulling that um that wagon down the hill okay so what we want to find out is this right here we want to figure out how much force that is. And then we want the equilibrium. We want how much force would be required to pull in the opposite direction to keep it from sliding down the hill. All right, so this force is the resultant of, of this 55 um, pound force. Now, so if I drew this, if let's say the ramp was steeper, you can see if it was steeper, let's say the hill was really steep like that. All right, then we have a force here, and here is the gravity. The, res the normal force, or the perpendicular force, that's much smaller, but you can see now, I mean, intuitively, a steeper hill is harder to hold back that wagon, so the force pulling that wagon down the hill is much larger this time. So the force required their equilibrium in the opposite direction is going to be much bigger than it was over here because the angle has changed. The angle's gotten much steeper. Does that make sense? So it, it, we're taking the, um, the, the force due to gravity, weight of this thing is being pulled down by gravity, and we're breaking it into two forces, which if we add them up would be the resultant force, which is the uh, the, the weight being pulled down by gravity. Okay, does that make sense? So just kind of wanted to, you know, intuitively, if you are trying to hold something back on a very, like, let's go to the extreme, the opposite extreme, like let's say it's nearly flat, then the force coming down, then the force going down the hill is very small, right? So, um, and if it was a flat ground, then there'd be no force pulling it down because there is no down, right? Okay, so... Anyway, that's sort of just my um, 
a little bit of like almost physics here where, where you will do this in physics. You will take and break a force up into what's called the normal force. Forget what this one's called. It's parallel, you know, it's, it's, it's along the, the ground, whatever that angle is. The other one is called the normal force, uh, perpendicular to it. Um, I don't know, I should look that up. I don't remember what that one's called. But anyway, um, all right, so we want to find that. That is what we're interested in finding. All right, so let's draw like maybe a bigger picture. And so here is that force, that 50 pound force. Um, and essentially we're making a right triangle in this case, right? Because the other side of this thing is the normal force. It's perpendicular to that ramp. All right, so we can use either triangle. Let's concentrate maybe on this triangle. So this is uh, 50 pounds. Now, that angle's 20. Can you tell me what angles any of these are? Right, so think about this triangle in here. Um, of course, uh, that's a right angle. So if that's 20, that angle in there has got to be 70, right? So this angle, is 70 degrees. As a result, this angle is the 20 degrees. Okay? Just kind of like, if you think about it for a second, this angle, that angle in there, is the same as that angle there. It's the angle that the uh, ramp and the 50 pound force make with each other. That angle in there is this angle. It's got to be supplementary because this is a right triangle here got to be supplementary to the ramp angle of 20 degrees. So that's 70 degrees. Okay. So remember, this is what we're looking for up there, X. So we could, um, we have a right triangle, so we can use SOHCAHTOA. Remember, we don't really use law of sines and law of cosines in right triangles. It's overkill. Um, so long as you know two sides or angles in a right triangle, you can use SOHCAHTOA. So let's see. So 70 uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. So sine of 70 degrees is going to be equal to x over the hypotenuse 50. Or I guess we, you know, we've been using u, but you know, as the as the um, as the force, and then that's a negative u or whatever you want to call it. All right. So then um, x is equal to 50 times the sine of 70 degrees. And again, I'm rounding this to the nearest whole, um, the nearest whole pound. And so X is um, 17 pounds. All right, so the, re the, the um, force required, and it's not asking about direction or anything like that. So the magnitude, so this force to hold that point in place from moving would be the equilibrium, which would be the opposite direction, but the same magnitude, so 17 17 pounds. All right, um, next one. A force of 16 pounds is required to hold a 40 pound lawnmower on an incline. What angle does the incline make with the horizon? Okay, so let's draw a picture. I'm gonna draw sort of a big picture. And I don't know what the angle measure is, so I'm just gonna draw something. It may not be perfectly to scale, okay. So uh, again, the lawnmower, we draw as a point, and we know that the force required to hold it in place would be this one up here, and that's 16, so so is this one. The force due to gravity pulling it down the hill is 16. All right, then we want to draw the 40 pound. So it should be a little, I don't know, maybe I didn't draw that perfectly to scale, but you know, it's not gonna be perfect because uh, you know, I don't know what this angle is, so I don't know how to draw this yet. I mean, so it's you know, but ultimately we're gonna break these two force this force, 40 pound force, into a resultant force and um a, a, a force along the ground. Again, I'm I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't remember what that force is called. Normal force and the other force. And so we're going to, again, make a right triangle. Okay. Uh, and this is theta. And let's call this beta. They're supplementary, uh, sorry, complementary to each other. So if we can find this angle, then we know um, that we do the supplement. So remember that this is a right angle in here. 
because this normal force is always perpendicular to the uh, plane or the, the uh, ramp surface. Okay. Um, so also this angle down here is beta, right? This one down, you know, at the bottom of this right triangle is beta too. So we're going to concentrate on this triangle and find, uh, and find theta. So think about theta uh, as it relates to these two things. So this is 40. This is 16. So that's the adjacent and the hypotenuse. So, so theta will be equal to Theta will be equal to the inverse cosine. Let's just jump to that, right? Theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So 16 over 40 is the ratio. And I got, in this case, 66.4 degrees. All right. And then um, if I wanted to find uh, the other angle, in this case, beta, right? Um, which is this one, uh, I could do a similar thing right there. So, or just take this uh, and do the complement of that, right? Because they're both part of that right. Or think about this. It's kind of easier to probably see this right triangle now. Um, and those have to be complementary. So that means my beta will be equal to 90 minus 66.4 for what, 23.6? <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the angle that it, the ramp makes with the horizon, this angle here, beta, is about 23.6 degrees. All right, let's move on to the last couple of examples on the third page. <clears throat> All right. Um, example number five. <clears throat> All right, so a ship leaves port on a bearing of north 25.0 25 deg degrees east and travels 61.4 miles. The ship then turns due east and travels 84.6 miles. How far is the ship from the port and what is the bearing from the port? So if you were to just go there directly, um, what, uh, what would be the bearing needed to get there? Okay, so we've done similar problems in the past, but when we create the right triangle, we always, when we create the triangle, we always ended up being a, well, a right triangle because we didn't know law of sines and law of cosines. But now we know law of sines and law of cosines. So first I'm gonna draw an XY coordinate plane. And the origin is where I'm starting from. All right, we'll call that P. That's the port. All right, the ship uh, leaves port on a bearing of north 25.0 degrees east. So that's north and then 25 degrees east. So I want to go this way, 25 degrees. I'm going to rotate 25 degrees past north. So, um, you know, something like that. Okay, and this, drawing an arrow, that vector is 61.4 miles. Yeah, miles. 61.4 miles. Okay. This angle in here, that is 25 degrees. Okay. Then we turn and we go due east. Now, I want it to be a little bit longer, right? It's a, uh, This was 61.4. This is 84 um, let's see if I can just draw it a little bit more east, literally, and a little longer, I don't know, something like that. Okay. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it's not going to be perfectly to scale. Uh, this is 84.6 miles. All right. Now what we want is um, how far is the ship from the port? So we want to really know the resultant. All right, let's call it U. The magnitude of U is what they're asking for. How far is it from the ship? And then we want to know what's the bearing. So in other words, what's if we knew this angle in here, then we would know the bearing from the north, right? That kind of thing. 
All right. Uh, so let's find the magnitude of u. The magnitude of u. Uh, we have what? We have side, side. Uh, let's see. We need to find some angles here. Um, can we find this angle? Think about that. Think about what that angle would be. If it helps, we can sort of superimpose another xy coordinate plane on here. And so I know that angle in there, that little one in here, is the same as this angle here, right? That angle and that angle are the same. Uh, because they're opposite angles. You know, this, this line is north-south. This line is north-south. So those two lines are parallel. Those two angles are alternate interior angles. And then this angle out here, this one's 90, right? Because that's due north, that's east, so that's 90 in here. That's uh, 25. So I think everybody can kind of see then that this angle here is 115 degrees, okay? And so what do we have? We have side, angle, side side, angle, side, which means we have to use law of cosine. Okay, and so what is that? All right, so that is the magnitude of u is um, one of the sides, 84.6 squared plus the other side, 61.4 squared minus two times the product of the two, 84.6 times um, times uh, 61.4, and then times the cosine of the angle between them, 115 degrees. All right, uh, we put all that in just, that's just pure calculator work. So the magnitude of U is 124. I'm just using three uh, uh, significant digits because these had three significant digits in it but so I'm rounding here um, to the nearest whole mile but again you might use a couple extra decimal places all right so we know the magnitude that is the first thing that they're asking for how far is the ship from the port that we don't care that question's not asking what direction it's just saying what's that length how far apart it is, and it is 124 miles. Okay, um, and again, you can use a couple more decimal places when you use it, but I rounded to 124. All right, next we want to find uh, this angle, really. Let's call it beta. We want to find that angle because that angle together at 25 would be my bearing. Okay, so I know now this side and the opposite angle pairing, I can go back to my law of sines. All right, in order to find my beta. So that means I can use sine of beta, beta over its opposite side, which is 84.6, uh, is equal to the sine of 115 degrees over, and again, if you want to use more decimal places, you can. So when we take that and we solve it, you know, we, we multiply both sides by 84.6, take the inverse sine of that ratio, uh, we get beta is equal to about 38.2 degrees. And so that together with the 25.0 degrees that they gave us, we should be able to say, okay, the bearing. The bearing is north 63.2 degrees east, all right, so that's a bearings, or remember another way of doing bearings was just, uh, in this case, it's gonna be the same number, but it's from the north, how far are you rotating? Even even if you had to go past uh, due east, you would just give that whole number, and that's one way of doing a bearings too. So we could just say on a bearing of 63.2 degrees. So either way, remember we had two ways of doing bearings, okay. Um, next example. So often we have problems where planes or boats start out in one direction, 
but while traveling, it is blown by wind or water currents uh, and has a different actual travel path. So let's look at this example here. Let's see if I, I'm fully focused here. Okay, it's a little small, the drawing, so. Um, all right, course and ground speed, that means the actual direction of the plane. So let's start. The, uh, the plane takes off and it's aimed in this direction and is flying in this direction. However, the wind is blowing at a constant speed in this direction. So the length of this vector represents the, the speed or magnitude of the wind that, you know, it's pushing it in that direction. And so the plane, even though it's aimed in this direction, it takes off, but it travels sort of in this direction, on this path, because while it's facing this way, the wind is blowing in this direction. And so slowly, surely, this is the actual path that it travels. All right. Uh, oh, this is just re reviewing your, your bearing, how two different ways of doing bearings too. Remember this going down here, I could say a bearing of 150 degrees, uh, or we could call that 30 degrees here. So it's south, 30 degrees east. Okay, so two different ways to do that for your bearings. Okay, uh, let's look at example six. A small plane follows a bearing of uh, north 70 degrees east uh, um, at an airspeed of 230 miles per hour and encounters a wind blowing at 25 miles per hour from a direct from a direction of north 70 degrees west. Okay, so now be careful. There's a lot of stuff going on here. So the first thing they're talking about is like the plane is going in that direction. So if there was absolutely no wind, that's the route it would take. All right. And it's speed that it's that it's traveling. Okay. Now the wind is blowing at a certain miles per hour at a certain direction. And so it's going to change the, the location and the direction that the plane is actually traveling. in. All right, so let's try to draw a picture. Okay, so I'm going to start. The plane is taking off from the airport at the origin of our XY coordinate plane. All right. Um, all right, it's traveling at 200 and 30 miles per hour, okay, north 70 degrees, so, okay, let's see, um, let's call this 20 degrees, that's 70 degrees, so it's taking off. If there were no wind, the plane would be traveling in that direction, okay? Um, and what we're gonna call here is not distance, but we're gonna do miles per hour here. So 230 miles per hour, okay. Um, all right, um, and then, so the wind is blowing at 20 miles per hour, much smaller force, right? Um, so like a tenth of this or so. Like, let, okay, so let's, let's make this a little longer, just so that we're not dealing with such small drawing. Okay. All right, so that is our 300, and that vector represents 230 degrees. Um, and so this is 70 degrees. All right. This, of course, is 20 degrees. All right. Now, the wind is blowing from a direction of north 70 degrees, um, 70 degrees uh, west. So that means over here. That means 70 degrees in this way. So let me see if I can kind of draw that in the same. Does that look about right? Maybe it's up a little bit. Okay, so this is 20 degrees, that's 70 degrees. It's blowing from that direction. So the arrows here, this is where it's going. So instead of putting it there, I think we should probably just put it here. I'm trying to draw it as best I can here. Kind of off to the side, looking down at this thing. All right, um, all right. So uh, if this is 230, this is 25. Trying to draw it kind of to scale. So this was actually too long. So something like that. Instead of drawing it over here, let's put them using our parallelogram um, 
rule. And so we're going to put them end to end. All right. So the parallelogram that results would be something like this. And the resultant would be something up here. All right. That is, you want to find the resultant bearing and ground speed. So we want to find U. We want to find a direction. Um, and we want to find magnitude. So let's start with the magnitude. All right, we can, uh, you know, use a right tri use a triangle in here. So I'm going to move this 20. This is 25 miles per hour. I'm going to move it up here, 25 miles per hour. So concentrate like on this triangle here, and um, and we want to find this. Now, can we find that angle up here? That's the key. We got to be able to find that angle. <clears throat> and we know that's 70. Um, we know this angle, let's see, uh, that's 70. We know, uh, we know this one, um, that's 70. So, okay. Um, having a problem visualizing this. Uh, so that means this, if I remember right. So wait a minute, let's see. This was 70 over here. 70 uh, northwest, okay. So this is also 20 degrees out here. Uh, that's, you know, where the uh, wind was coming from. So that means this is 20. And also up here, this one is 20. So that means this whole angle down here between the two vectors should be 40, right? Because this was, if we're looking, let me draw this due east and due west in here a little bit more darkly. All right, so we're 20 degrees below due east and we're 20 degrees above due east here. So the angle between them in that parallelogram is 40 degrees. So that means this angle in the parallelogram is 140. So in other words, the angle up here is 140 degrees. All right, that's kind of crucial. You have to be able to pick that apart and find that angle. All right, so now uh, in that triangle, I have a side, an angle, and a side, so we can use our law of cosines. All right, so we have 230 squared plus 25 squared minus 2 times 230 times 25 cosine of the angle between them, 140 degrees. All right, and so when we put that into our calculator, we should get something like 249.7 miles per hour. Now, let's think about if that makes sense. Uh, do Are we expecting that this will be uh, larger than what we started with at 230? And I think you would agree that yes, it should be. Um, because the wind isn't exactly blowing against it. It's kind of partly pushing it in the direction that we were traveling anyway. It's just that it's not in the exact same direction. So it makes sense that the resultant is a larger magnitude than the airspeed. We are traveling faster um, than we would have been without the airspeed. Uh, without the wind, I mean. Okay. Um, all right. So now what we want to do is find the magnitude, uh, the uh, the bearing. And so we need to find, that's the resultant, we need to find this angle. Because that angle together with 70, that will tell me my bearing. Okay. So what is beta? Uh, and again, I think we have opposite side, opposite angle uh, set up so we can do sine. So the sine of beta over its opposite side, which is 25.0, if you will, equals the sine of 140 divided by the 200, uh, 230. Now, on my notes, I have typed 250, and so I just want to make sure that I have the right answer here when I type this in. Um, 230, yeah, my, my notes have 250. I'm not sure why. 
Um, 230, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I had a different value at some point. So let's calculate this, right? So I'm going to move the 25 up. Um, so we have, let's just write it out. We have beta is equal to the inverse sine of, should be 25 sine of 140 degrees over 230. All right, let me type that into my calculator. Uh, 20, uh, 25, uh, let's just do the whole thing at once. Inverse sine of 25 sine, uh, okay, wait a minute. I see my calculator is in radians. Hang on, let me convert that to degrees. Okay, um, all right, it's in degrees now. All right, inverse sine of 25 sine of 140, and then uh, divide that by 230. 230. Okay. Um, and I get... Uh, okay, that has got to be wrong. I'm getting 4. Well, I guess it could be 4, but... Um, oh, yeah. Um, 4? Oh, beta. Yeah, beta could be pretty, that beta looks pretty small. So I get um, 4.006. Uh, I, I just want to try that again uh, because I've gotten, I think my notes have 250. So of course it would be a little bit different, but I just want to check that again. Uh, 25 times the sine of 140. Um, and then I'm going to get that answer, divide by 230, and then I'm going to take the, um, okay, no, that did not work. Uh, let's try that again. Um, 25, I don't have my good calculator with me. I'm using some old rinky-dink thing here. Um, sine of 140, um, and then let's divide that by 230, and now I'm going to take the inverse sine of that. So second sine of the previous answer. Yeah, I get four. Okay, so I'm pretty confident that that's right. So 40.006. All right, and so then that we wanna to add to the original bearing. Remember this is north, and so we'll say north, um, you know, basically 74 degrees, 74.01 if you want, but 74 degrees uh, east. Or remember the different way of doing bearings, you could just say on a bearing of 74.01 degrees. That's a point, let's, let's put in the decimal in there. Um, 74.01 degrees, I know it's probably more accurate than we should really be reporting, but yeah, so anyway, something like that. Okay, um, so this is your uh, homework here, uh, the second homework assignment on section 8.3.